Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. Coming up this week, we've got our record tech, a nine kilogram e-bike, a fancy pants bike storage solution, plus sunglasses with windscreen wipers on them. And we're gonna go through all the observations from the weekend's men's and women's Paris-Roubaix, which was literally incredible. What on earth has happened to your voice? Um, well, this happened. I pray a pretty baby, now that I found a mistake, Yeah, I've just come back from GCM Mallorca, an unforgettable event, and I absolutely loved every minute of it, but we did miss you, Alex, and, uh, Ollie, well, I wanted to ask you, would, would you wear aero socks for a 2K hill climb? Um, no, I absolutely wouldn't, no. Right, it's on that note, yeah. should we start the GCM Tech Show? Let's do it. First up, let's take a look at last week's poll. So, hold on, there isn't actually a poll. There isn't, is there, no. Ollie and Manon were having such a great time in Mallorca with you that they uh, forgot to create one. But the main talking point was about blockchain technology and passports for bikes, which I think is a great idea to keep, help keep bikes nice and secure, reduce theft, something that we could probably see more of in the future. Yeah, for sure. But I think we should go straight on to our main talking point. And on Saturday, saw the first ever women's Paris-Roubaix. And on Sunday, well, it both was an epic event because the weather was quite spectacular. Yeah, it's the first rain-soaked edition we've yeah. had since 2002. And God, there was loads of stuff going on. So we thought we'd just talk about some of our tech observations from the event, nice and simple. So let's start with the bike of newly crowned world champion, Elisa Balsamo. Mm. Cannondale Super 6 Evo High Mod. It looks incredible. What do you make of the paint? Oh, I mean, Alex, you're asking the right person because I've got to say, I love a white bike. And if you're world champion, you've got to have the rainbow stripes on there somewhere. And she's got it across the entire bike. But it's bold using white bar tape in Paris Bay, isn't it? Yeah, I was a little bit surprised to see Ooh. that. But something that caught my eye, the main thing that caught my eye about this bike is that it's built up using Shimano's Ultegra DI2 group set as opposed to the top spec Dura Ace. Something we can only kind of speculate about, isn't it? Whether it was out of choice because they didn't the want it. Or the shortage, yeah. So like you say, we don't know, but it's an interesting point nonetheless. Now, it will come as no surprise to all of you guys at home that, well, Alex loves tubeless tyres, don't you, Alex? Oh, I do love them. And you're yeah. pretty happy, aren't you? Oh, I couldn't have been any happier. I sat Sunday night, feet up on the sofa, knowing that loads of the riders were using tubeless tyres at Paris Bay. And in fact, Lizzie Dignan was using them, wasn't she? Yeah, she was using the Pirelli P0 TLRs. I think she was on 28 to 30 mil tyres, which is slightly bigger than the last time they raced it in 2002, isn't it? Well, for the men's, obviously it was the first time Ooh. for the women's, but the men's winner, Sonny Cabrelli, was using the new Continental GP5000 STR tyre, a tyre that incidentally I've taken a closer look at on the Tech Channel earlier this week, so check that out. And he was using a 32 mil tyre, which is super wide, isn't it? Um, so presumably running them at a lower pressure than what they would do on a normal road stage. And there's been a big shift, hasn't there, over the last couple of years. So we're seeing more and more teams using tubeless tyres in some situations when there's an advantage to be had, including tyre liners, aren't they? Mm. Many riders ride tubeless liners nowadays because you, when you puncture, you can ride on that foam insert, meaning you can hold a relatively good pace, but the big thing is you don't actually pay a rolling resistance penalty when you've got fully time pumped up tyres. Yeah, it's interesting talking about tubeless tyres because we actually saw, especially on punctures, we saw Moscon, team mm. ass rider, of course. leading the race with just over a minute's lead. However, he did suffer puncturing his tubeless tyres and it would appear, although I don't know this for certain, that they weren't using any tyre liners. You could see the sealant sprayed all over his bike and as such, he did have to change onto his spare bike, lost a lot of his lead in the race, and then it would appear his spare bike had the tyres pumped up rock solid, didn't they? Well, schoolboy error that really, isn't it? Maybe, Because yeah. he was just skitting all over the place. Would you say he could have held the gap if he had been tubeless tyre liners? Um, I think it might have helped. Mm. And I think one of the key things is how the tyre pressures maybe been set exactly how he had his race bike set on his spare bike. I think he might have held his lead for a little bit longer. But it's just an interesting point to make, isn't it? The tubeless tyres aren't infallible. No, and what would you say is the pressure 
that they were probably running out. Well, actually, that's an interesting point because there's a big change between teams using hooked and hookless tyres. So if you're using a hookless tyre and hookless rim, you have to stick to the maximum pressure of 75 psi. Yep. I think 74.5. But anyway, I can imagine we'd see riders using in the region of somewhere between 60 and 70 psi, depending on the tyres they're using and how heavy they are. Makes slightly difference to the uh, 10 years ago when they were riding probably 120. Oh yeah, 120 psi. So yeah, back in 2002, when it was that last wet edition, we could probably be pretty safe on saying riders would have been using 23 mil tires, which looks super Ooh. narrow compared to today's standards. How times have changed. Now, if you haven't seen the severity of the cobbles, then let me tell you, they are incredibly severe. So severe that a lot of the riders actually tape up their fingers or hands and contact points. And actually I saw on Lizzie Darnell's bike that she had blood dripped on our handlebars, which looked like a scene, well, a murder scene. And I'm taking that slightly too far, but it genuinely looks how severe this race really is. I mean, she didn't, even have any, she didn't even have any gloves on. Yeah, so why did she have yeah. gloves? Yeah, that could have helped somewhat, yeah. but we did see riders taping up their hands, even if they wore gloves, but it just highlights just how bad and aggressive the terrain is on the body. Peter Sagan, incidentally, also had not a great day out on Sunday, shall no. we say. His race was pretty much scuppered by crashes and all sorts of incidents due to the weather conditions. Mm. But something interesting about Peter Sagan and, and his equipment choice, so he was riding the Specialized Roubaix, similar bike to what he rode to Victory a couple of years ago with that head shock design, so the suspension just up by the handlebars. But an interesting point is that he had mechanical Durace gears on his bike, as opposed to the electronic DIT ones. Similar to what Fabian Cancellari used to do, right? Exactly cool. like that. I'm impressed you knew that. Um, and so the reason behind this is said to be to reduce the chance of accidentally shifting gear over the rough terrain. So when you're holding on, you're just not gonna... Imagine dropping it into the 11 tooth accidentally all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah or it just, uh, well, popping a cable popping out. Yeah, I guess all that, yeah. Done. Maybe slightly more robust. Now, over the last few months, we've been seeing the Canyon-supported teams going back to the new air road. Yeah, so I've seen this on Sunday, and something interesting that caught my eye is that they've gone back to using a two-piece bar and stem, so not their one-piece carbon cockpit that we've seen them using in the past. And it was really interesting and surprising to me to see that because the one-piece design is said to be far more aerodynamic than an usual setup, and Canyon say, that it saves 5.5 watts when ridden at 45 kilometers an hour, which is like a fairly good saving, I think we can all agree. But what it did make me wonder was, if Matthew van der Poel had saved 5.5 watts over the entire 240 kilometer event, do you think that would be enough for him to have won? Like I mean, that's a scratch your head moment, isn't it? Yeah. So I thought, well, it'd be an opportunity for us to do a poll. Oh. What do you think? Because I have no idea. Make sure you vote over on the GCN app, yeah. yeah. Could Matthew van der Poel have won Paris Bay had he used an aerodynamic handlebar? Yes or no? Guy, I'm intrigued here. I'm intrigued saying. because they sat at 45k an hour. For a long time. Yeah. Well, could he have won? Oh, I don't know. Now, Alex, you've got a pretty keen eye, especially when watching these races, and you've uh, picked up some more interesting things, haven't you? Yeah, something I never thought I'd see in the pro peloton. So this was on Sunday in the men's race. Christophe Laporte, I spotted him using his foot on the back wheel to brake. So presumably, it had a mechanical issue with either just the rear brake or the front one as well. And it was kind of like, you remember when you were a kid and you had a BMX and the brakes were rubbish um, and you'd use like your trainer on the tires to slow down. It was literally like what you do as a kid. Apart from the fact, he's got some fancy pants carbon shoes on and it looked like it was not very effective. There you go, hack or bodge. Um, we don't do that on this show, but I'm going to call it a bodge. Yeah, I think I'll be with you. <laughs> Shoes turning into brakes. Yeah. That's yeah, well, it, eventually he did get his spare bike off the team car. It just took a little bit of time because of all the carnage behind. The team cars are all held up. But it was something, yeah, I just never thought I'd see it. Now, let's start off hot tech with one thing that really did catch my eye. Wait till you see these. Yes, these are sunglasses with wipers in, which I thought would be perfect for Parube. Um, I can see one slight flaw in your plan, unfortunately. Hit me. I've checked the reviews on Amazon, and most people are saying the batteries last for about two minutes. Um, ah. Seeing as the Parube men's event was six hours. Yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah, maybe I'm going to have to rethink Back that. to the drawing board? Yeah, or get a bigger battery. Mm. Anyway, on to some slightly more serious and interesting tech, shall mm. we say. So last week, 
Dan Bingham and Joss Loudon took on the hour world record on the track, of course. And Dan's main focus was targeting the British record. So he achieved 54.723 kilometers, claiming a new British record, beating Bradley Wiggins' old one. However, he wasn't eligible for the world record, was he? Yeah, he wasn't eligible because he's not part of the testing pool on the anti-doping regulations, which uh, allows riders to compete for that UCI world record. And also, he's not part of the biological uh, passport. So, yeah, he wasn't able to go for that world record, but he wasn't far off, was he? Yeah, so even if he had been eligible, he didn't quite manage to surpass Victor Campanot's current world record. He was, in fact, 366 metres short, oh. which equates to about a lap and a half of the track. Which but over an hour isn't a huge amount. It's not a huge amount, but it did have some really sort of interesting tricks. Mm. I mean, we could talk forever about all of the little details, but a few bits I've picked out were, he's using the Argon 18 Electron track bike, which is the same as the Danish Olympic team have used. He used a Vortex skin suit. He's got some watch shop custom handlebars, and also, he was using, wasn't using the POC helmet, which is Dan's normally a big fan of, isn't it? Yeah, he was using the, he normally kind of uses that POC Temple helmet that he was being a big advocate over the last yep. couple of years. But he actually used the cask uh, one. Mistral. The Mistral. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is because he's obviously done a lot of testing and his CDA and his body shape doesn't fit uh, the, well, that POC helmet and it probably wasn't the fastest for him. Uh, so yeah, he, he went for that cast version I reckon, instead, which is interesting. I reckon we could see Dan back to try and attempt a world record. Oh, 100%. Maybe at altitude, try and get a little bit of extra distance in that. Maybe he's learned some stuff from his first attempt, but it's interesting to see. And I'm rumored, well, some of the rumors around the, the power that Dan had to hold for his attempt were around 350 to 360 watts, which is considerably lower than Wiggins is reported to have held for his effort. Which makes you think maybe Ollie's Aero Socks wins out. Maybe they were worth it. Is Aero King? <laughs> I don't know. The day before Dan's owl record, Joss Loudon took on the women's owl record herself and claimed a new title with a distance of 48.405 metres, yeah, was it? that's it. So that beat the current world record by 398 metres and both of their attempts were in the Gretchen Velodrome in Switzerland. Yeah, it was an incredible, incredible achievement. And I've got to say, it was quite cool watching her do it, but she was using the POC Temple helmet, uh, contrary to what Dan Biggin was wearing. But they do seem to be a bit of a power couple. And I did take a good look at the skin suit she was using. Now, she was going for a, a custom-made aero skin suit by Lacole. Now, I reckon she's done a lot of testing in the McLaren wind tunnel because uh, they've got a collaboration collaboration going on yeah there and is it that. should be interesting to see what comes out of that soon joss was also using exactly the same frame set as dan's the argon 18 electron frame set which presumably they've heavily tested and decided is the fastest setup mm. for them and the watch shop extensions as well oh yeah so they've got very similar setups between mm. them aren't they? yeah cool to see very cool on to more hot tech now, and Stastock has bought out probably the most elaborate bike stand and general storage unit I think I've ever seen. Oh, this would look just right in your front room. It man. would, it would it's look right so clean, wouldn't it? So this is a bike <clears throat> storage solution. You can hang your bike on it, your shoes, your glasses, your jersey, your helmet. So keep everything neat, looking smart and tidy, all in one place. Um, it's maybe not sort of everyone's cup of tea, but I think it's quite a neat little solution. It's available in a few different colours. Gold. Gold, if, if that's your thing. That's what I would go for anyway. Yeah. If you're going to get it, go gold. Yeah, but I, it's, it's cool to see a different storage solution that keeps everything in one place and kind of presents it quite nicely. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I rate it actually. Up next in hot tech is Jack the Rack. What an incredible name for product. So it's a super sleek and minimalist bike rack to go on the handlebars and store stuff out the front. Maybe ideal if you're picking up some different pizza boxes. And it's made from a single 304 stainless steel rod. I don't actually know the weight of it, but I could imagine it's incredibly light. And it includes a couple of different shims to fit different size handlebars. So one for 31.8 mil bars and then 24.5, I think. So mm. it's quite cool. Very nice. Now, Ollie Bridgewood is not here today to tell you about his success at the GCN Mallorca event, but he did take on the ominous Sacalobra climb. Now, he's been wanting to PB it, go under 30 minutes, and he did just that. Yeah, he averaged a whopping 334 watts for the entire climb. 
he averaged 19 kilometers per hour. He did get some help from our, our oh, GCN yeah. on Espanol team. Uh, from, he has some uh, lead out riders, Sebastian did he? Yeah, he did. Rumor has it, not only did he use some aero socks for that as well, he did. He also asked someone to carry his phone yeah. to the top of the climb for him because he thought it would save weight. There we go. Um, it did pay off. Ollie's time was 29 minutes and 33 seconds, I think. Um, and he averaged five watts per kilo, which is very comparable to some very good bike riders, mm. isn't it? So I, as much as I love giving Ollie a hard time for lots of things, um, I take my hat off to that. He's in form. Mm. He actually dropped a lot of people. There's absolutely no way I could replicate no. that. So fair play, good job. And keep an eye on that because I think we potentially are doing a video around on GCN in the not too distant future. Oh, like a deep dive into that. Oh, That's I like it. that. Final bit of hot tech this week, and we've got a nine kilogram e road bike, which is said to be the lightest production e road bike available in the world. And it's a bike built in collaboration between Ares and high performance systems who are known for their various mobility solutions. Yeah, and it's incredibly light, isn't it? Nine kilograms, which isn't a lot more than my average road bike. <laughs> yeah, so this thing has got the motor and the battery encased inside the carbon frame, provides 200 watts of assistance. What? Yeah, I know, that's good, isn't it? And um, I haven't seen a lot of figures about the range or the capacity of the battery, mm. but presumably it isn't anything to set the world on fire because, and it would make the bike too heavy otherwise. Yeah, and there's not thousands out on the market, is no. there? There's only 24 available at the moment, but it just shows where e-bikes are going. There's a whole load more technology going in there to make them lighter and last longer. Oh, that's really cool. More hot tech next week. Next week. It's now time for screw riding upgrades. Bye. Upgrades. This is where you submit evidence of upgrades that you made to your bikes, equipment, or cycling lives for the chance to win an ultimate prize. What is it, Hank? The GCN water bottle. Yeah, you were hoping we changed it by Yeah, I was hoping you were going to give us some tools or uh, maybe a GCN apron, maybe in the near future, right? We don't have a GCN apron. We're not a cooking channel. Anyway, <laughs> um, who have we got this week? You start us off. So Taylor, who's actually done some bike bags before, and uh, he found out that he's got some pretty good talent and uh, he had some really good positive feedback and thought he would take his skills up to the next level and he's made some bespoke bags for his gravel bike. Check these Ooh. out. And I've got to say, Taylor, you've got some incredible talent because... They look they good. I, so I, I saw the first version of these that um, this person made and I've got to say, the second ones for this gravel bike are amazing. Look how... Look how well they mimic the shape of the frame. I was going to say, if I was going to go bikepacking, those are the bags I'd want to take. <laughs> well, there you go. Homemade homemade bags for everyone. Yeah. Thanks for sending those in. Who's next? Up next, we've got... Oh, I love this. What a name. Easy to pronounce. <laughs> this is the sort of username I need to be reading out all the time. Likewise. Yeah, so they say, Hi, GCN team. Since I have a modern carbon bike, my old but pretty Pinarello steel bike stood mostly unused in the basement, so... To bring it to life, they've upgraded from 8-speed down tube shifters to a 9-speed nine, nine drivetrain with STI levers, wider tyres, and some mud guards or fenders, if you're in America. Fendor. Yeah. Wow. Check Love the look out. of that, I've got to say. Real retro. Yeah, the retro bikes are probably my favourite, if I'm honest. Nice little works station down in the background. Down tube shifters, beautiful. Yeah, I've got so, to say, big fan of that. Yeah, I like, I like the way... The, the mud guards are added on. Like I think mud guards upgrade of the sort of tires, the group set and stuff at the bottom. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm a big fan of that. But the most important thing, it isn't down to us, is it? Yeah, and there's there's two very different contestants there. Yeah. So uh, I'm really interested to see who you guys vote for. Mm, so head over to GCN app. Vote for which upgrade you like the best, and we'll discuss the results next week. Quick one, Alex. Who are you going for, mate? Uh, oh, the bike bags. Yeah, I'll take the Pirelli. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. 50-50. Up to you. It's now time for the bike vaults and something I haven't done in a long while, so I thought, well, Alex, I'll take over. Yeah, this is the part of the show where you submit the pictures of your bikes and we judge them to be either nice or super nice, and if they're super nice... You know what happens. Yeah, I get to ring the bell. So I hope there's a lot of super nice bikes in this vault. <laughs> yeah, I'll start us off uh, with Rafael Higuros with a Trek Imonda ALR 2021. Oh, I like this. Pink, Hit me with some stats. Pink bottle cages, 
Um, Tan wheel tires, valves aligned, although it looks like we might have a valve cover on the front wheel, but not the back wheel. My aging eyes can't quite I was going to say, blimey, you look in detail. Yeah. Um, but I like that. Yeah, I'm going to go super nice. What's your vote? Yeah. Um, Slam stem. It's looking good. Paint bottles. Super nice for me. You go to town on that, don't you? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah. Who's next? You can intro. I don't get to do this an awful lot, so uh, when I do... Uh, right, up next is pedalling through life. Great username. We all, we all tried to pedal yeah. through life, don't we? Uh, steel is real. This is the 8-bar Cron Prince in all its glory with a SRAM ETAP for fast shifting. This is the team edition setup that I will race for the 2021-2022 season. Oh, I like this. It's running DT Swiss GRC wheels, which were the gravel wheel set. The reason for this is that has 25 millimeter width and allows me to run 30 mil tires like uh, well, Sonia Cobrelli. Well, he was running 32s, wasn't he? Fantastic. Yeah. Shall we judge it for the bike vault? I think we should. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, minimal accessories, I really like that. Sleek. Oh, God, this is aligned. so me. Cool this background. is so me. Is Mate, it that's so me. Look at it. It's simple, it's classic. It's got those round tubes. Simple, yeah. It's just, it's carbon forks, isn't it? Yeah. It's, oh, mate. Ooh, Tangle tires. Yes, mate. Apparently that's a super nice. That, On to the next one. You guys, it's super nice, right? Okay, right. Yeah. Next up, we've got Matt-H-BKK with a Vitus 992. Wow, that's another sick bike. 1992. Were you even born in 1992? I was born in 1992. There you, there you go. go. So More obviously... things in common with this bike. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's got a bit of me around about, you know, that's, you know, it's shiny, it's it's uh, pretty like outrageous looking, the, um, it's cool. I like the way the bike bike this week has turned into a reference in bikes to you, which is quite nice. Um, I <laughs> think this, this bike does look stunning. I really like the polished um, I surface love that on the wheels, the frame. Really... Oh, Salitalia flight saddle. I haven't seen one of those for a long time. I'm all over that. Yeah. All right, I'm going super nice. It just doesn't have the valves lined up. Yeah, but I can I know let that's, it slide. A, that's a stickler in the bike bike vault. I'm prepared to let it slide because it looks incredible. And also it's not in the big ring. Yeah, I'm, I'm overlooking Letting that slide too. Yeah. But the yellow and the aluminium... Go on, ring the bell. Ring the bell. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Next it actually up... brings tears to my heart because that is actually stunning. <laughs> genuinely. Next up we've got... Peter Bell or Peter Bell? Yeah, just finished the dream bike builds. The Amethyst Project One paint with all the oil, slick anodized accessories, down to the headset bolt, titanium cages, and bar tape. God, they I love, love oil slick stuff, it's so cool. Yeah, it is. Let's have a look at this Trek Project One Madon SLR OMG. Now, that is bloody cool. Wow. Yeah. Look at that paint job. That's one of those paint jobs that kind of adapts with the light and the angle you look at it. Iridescent, I, I think. Um, Iridescent, mm. beautiful word. Well, let's just quickly judge it. Valves definitely aligned. Yeah. Biggie Smalls, no accessories. Biggie smalls. Incredible oil slicked bolts, bottle oh, cages. Oh, look at those bottle cages. Look at that. Yeah. I, I, Towel honest, tires. To be nice honest, I don't care what for... you say, that's getting a super nice. That's getting a su super nice, please. Come on. <laughs> It's like being on the side of Pyru Bay with my cowbell. <laughs> right, next, next up, Safa. My Canyon Esports Ultimate with Ceramic Speed, OSPW System, and Muckoff Tubeless Tires. Right, yeah, there we go. Now that, those canyons do look good, don't they? They look clean. That's cool. Proper German it. More engineering. Importantly, how cool is the background? That is. Oh, that's, that's all you. I mean, you that's would love that. That that, 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 look, your bedroom would look like that, <laughs> wouldn't it? That You'd is, have posters of tools. If I'm honest, I wish my work from home was as good as that. <laughs> Bloody great. Um, look at so, those big over, oversized jockey wheels as well. Valves aligned, in the correct gear, tan wheel tires. Saddlebag on saddle like bag. that. Man, I would appreciate that. Yeah. Do you uh, know what? I think I'm, I'm going to go with another super nice. This is almost wait, unheard wait. of. I'm going to go for super nice on this. Oh, I... Yeah, I'm going to have to go super nice, but I feel like we're giving these out willy-nilly, but 
They they are all super nice bikes. Right, we've got loads. Of, we've got a couple to get through. Let's keep going. Um, Sorry, William Guy with his Merida Reacto disc. Um, I'm holding off. It's a beautiful bike. Love the Merida Stealth Edition, but it's not super nice for me. It's not doing it for you. Nah. On to the last one of the bike for this week, and we've got Ocean Rose has sent in their Carnaga C40 from back in 2003. And I've got to say, if I was going to have a bike, the Carnaga C40 would be the one, I reckon. Apparently it's a beautiful so. Beautiful bike. What do you think? What a backdrop. Backdrop is very stunning. Mm. However, I've got a few little bones to pick about yeah, the bike. Yeah, I, I have a feeling you. The valves are almost aligned, but not quite. The oh, cranks that's harsh. The cranks are not aligned but they're not vertical or horizontal. Get that. Um, instead of using a stand or a shadow stand, they're actually using their bike yeah, that's helmet. that's smart. It's not smart. Safety first, you don't want to damage your bike helmet. The gears oh, could be acceptable. Biggie spoils, mate. But, uh, I'm, I'm going to end on just a nice. What's sorry, your... I'm sorry, Ocean Rose, I'm going to do two. Okay, just right, a nice just a nice. Too. Right, we're ending on Justin Eyes. Unfortunately, that's the end of this week's bike vault, which means it's the end of the GCN Tech Show. Yeah. I wish it never ended, but unfortunately it has. If you've enjoyed the show, please let us know in the comments section down below. Mm. And, well, I guess I'll see you in a couple of months. Yeah, mm. hopefully I'll be allowed back on the Tech Show. If you enjoyed it, yeah, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you do, I'll give it a ring of the bell.